if I'm anticipating taking more days off than not, then by all means, crush myself. But when you flip that switch of today was awesome and I really want to make tomorrow awesome. So instead of staying up an extra two and a half hours watching some stupid Netflix documentary, I'm going to go to sleep because I want to try at least repeat it, if not make it better tomorrow. And you can't do that by wiping yourself clean every single day. You caught me off guard there, buddy. <laughs> Jeez, better late than never. Yeah, well, or early than never. Early than, yeah, I mean, it's like the... We're early and late. We're early, well, technically we're neither. We're always on time since we produce a, a podcast twice a week for totally free. We're never really late. No, uh, <laughs> right. You know, we, we are never really late. But welcome to that free podcast, Crushing Iron, Triathlon Podcast, episode... 273 274 Ugh, man i gotta listen this i, yeah. I gotta get back Let's on track move. I, gotta, I, gotta, I know i'm moving and then as soon as i get my desk set up i'll get the i'll get the flip the cards on 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 the desk uh, i got a great little kind of podcast counter from robbie kraus and so i gotta get that back on the desk get back in the game <laughs> episode 74 and i'm back i believe uh-huh. in you man yeah, I know you do. But before we get into the deep stuff, uh, <laughs> blessed is the child that sleeps in till quarter to eight. He channeled his inner Mike Turali this morning, and uh, if this is your first time tuning in, I've got a soon-to-be three-year-old who has, ever since the day he came out, has been all about uh, going to bed early, maybe sleeping, and then regardless of the amount of sleep, getting up at like the crack of dawn. And this morning, he, I got up around 5, 5.15 when I was alarming off. He was still sleeping, came out into the den to read, and she texted me and was like, hey, Hayden's up. And I was like, crap, because his, his daycare is not opening until 8 on the summer hours. And I was like, man, that's two and a half hours to kill. Uh, that's a long time. And uh, <laughs> I was like, you think he's going to go back to sleep? And so she texted me about five minutes later, and he went back to sleep. And then she got up, and then the hours ticked away, you know, and the minutes ticked away. And the next thing you knew, I'm like, dude, I'm going to be late. I mean, I'm going I'm to be late for the 9 o'clock podcast, which usually we drop. So anyway, it was uh, it was definitely a great thing. And again, he was uh, he was channeling his inner Mike Trolley, making sleep his priority and uh, getting well-rested. Is it you think that's what it was? He's finally he, starting to understand the appreciation. But I hope so, uh, especially like when we move. Um, I'm hoping he like sleeps in because it'll be a game changer for for our life and like the things that we can get up and do and really take advantage of of where we're moving and and the things we'll be able to do from our house. So it would be awesome if that happens. I'm sure it won't right when we move there because you know new surroundings and new environment. Uh, even if they're good changes, they're still stress. And, you know, it's still kind of things are you're kind of off your game a little bit. Um, and so it'll probably take a little bit of time, but yeah, that would be outstanding if he could if he could do that, and that would open up a lot of doors and avenues for for Ali and I to get some other things done, uh, work a little bit, get a little get a couple training sessions in before he even gets out of bed, and uh, be ready for the rest of the day. But I hope so. I hope he's taking the sleep thing seriously. Uh, I you know ever I didn't really take sleep as seriously until we had a kid, and then. The first two years, and even I mean, still, I'm like, dude, you know me. I if I'm texting you past eight o'clock, you're like, man, he's really feeling it today. He's I know. Of, he's, <laughs> in a, like, he's in a group. Oh, here's um, a great idea. And then I look at the clock, and it's like eight twenty. I'm like, <laughs> damn it, he's already in bed. Yeah, he's already in bed. Just uh, it's funny. I had an athlete text me or email me last night at like nine something, knowing that I would get it the next day. He was like, today, Wednesday, uh, because uh-huh. I don't, you know, already be asleep. But no, he slept well. And I feel well rested, and it was a great start to the day. And uh, hey, welcome back, Crushing Iron Podcast two seventy four. It's a Thursday. It's June fifth, two thousand nineteen. And now a word from our sponsors. There's. All right, that was it. All right. Anyway, so you got a good topic for us today? Oh, um, n- well, uh, no. I, I mean, I was going to talk about. Uh, roll, so. What? <laughs> hey. We, I am the age grouper, and uh, <laughs> this is Coach Robbie. This is what we try to do. We try to figure out triathlon. I, well, you were going into sleep there, and it kind of reminded me of something I was thinking about. 
which is generally respecting my body. That's kind of where I've been trying to look lately. Mm-hmm. Take care of the body. Um, you know, in numerous ways. And sleep is certainly one of them. But, like, you know, it's like this fine line between where to push it and where to not push it. And, you know, it's funny because yesterday or Monday when we recorded, I had told you that was my day off and I, it ended up not being a day off. <laughs> it, well, but I took out a short 20 minute run, which mm-hmm. I, I was just, I was just kind of charged up, man. I'm like, yeah. all right, I'm going to go out and do a little run. So actually today is my day off, just so you know, which is Wednesday. Yeah, I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't believe you. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny you kind of say that in terms of like, I know there's a lot of things or routes we could go in, in respecting your body. And I kind of had kind of had a, a few thoughts about that one. It's just is something I had, um, well, while you were talking, that I had kind of sunk in with me. And, you know, in like respecting your body, like for a lot of athletes, like the way that the way that they approach training and then in the approach training sessions is is oftentimes also of a way that they approach um, experiences or uh, events or things that they really need to happen in their regular life. So if you see an athlete who, because you know th- via social media we can see these kind of athletes all over the place. We probably have friends that are like that. I often have to, t- to like talk athletes off ledges that they if there isn't something crazy spontaneous. Uh, epically challenging going on in their life they're like at a loss and they feel like they're totally lost with where they're going like there has to be something big and that oftentimes also a direct reflection of who they are when they train everything has to be go big or go home because if they don't then they feel like they're wasting their time but they're really only wasting their time because they really have no direction their direction that's not true they have a direction but the directional is only uh um mapped out for the next 45 minutes it's not, uh, it's not linear in that it's going to keep going, going on, and going on, and going on, and going on forever. Right. Uh, hopefully, you know. See, so and then you have other athletes who are very, very consistent, and can, like it's funny. Like the most, the athletes that I have, they're the most consistent. That rarely, rarely ever miss sessions. That are totally bought in. They never stray way off the radar. And they're like, hey, coach, sorry, I got quote unquote lost on my run today and ran nineteen uh, instead of ten. You know, you've always got those, you know, athletes like, oh, I took the wrong turn today, and I went, <laughs> first to seven, like, yeah, you're totally full shit. Like, I don't believe anything you're saying to me right now. Um, it's funny that they just don't lose track count in the pool. They're like, oh, coach, my bad. I did 5,500 today. I knew it was a 2K swim, but I, I just kind of lost track of, of time and ended up doing, you know, my longest swim ever. Yeah, no one's no one's ever said that. But the ones that are, the, like, the most consistent and and – follow the pattern and aren't caught up in going way too hard way too often they are the most consistent but they're also the most usually and i mean almost every time they're the most successful at what they're trying to accomplish but then they're also the ones that show the most what i would call athletic i would call it control athletic self-control but i would call it having a great relationship between the fleeting thoughts that we have as triathletes um, that we should let just kind of go in and in and out through our our our, uh, our psyche without acting upon them, uh, and then into the real life, like they just they they get raced two or three times a year and be perfectly fine and then do well at them. Whereas another athletes who might be four days a week here, eight days a week, you know, eight training sessions this week, zero the next week. They're spontaneous all over the place. They got, you know, 17 sprint triathlons, a couple of 5Ks, 17 killer runs, a Spartan race, 38 other Olympic distances, and like two half Ironmen they both signed up for 10 days in advance. They're all over the place. And then they wonder why they aren't super successful. So I think there's a direct correlation there between the two. But the other part that, that sunk in with me was uh, in terms of respecting your body and how you see it. Is is an athlete that I was I was kind of having an email exchange with uh, on Monday or maybe even Sunday, um, who like a lot of athletes. I mean, you, I think I think most people would think you would, it would be surprising, but it shouldn't be that. A lot of endurance athletes, like more oftentimes than not, uh, I've found in my experience, struggle with some sort of depression, anxiety, past trauma, something. 
you know, I wouldn't call them they all have mental illness, but the, everybody has experienced some kind of something. And this athlete has, has struggled with kind of mild or probably maybe even serious depression, anxiety for a period of time. And he has seen really great benefits from reducing his medication during kind of higher volume. And then when he got a little bit less volume on one week to, to, to do some built-in recovery that he needed, he, his immediate thought when he saw that, that lower number was, this is bad. Something, and so he actually had a very rough week. And so in, in the process of, of him trying to figure out what that means and was it actually a, a trend or was it just a, you know, did it just, was it a, more of a coincidence? Cause there was a lot of other variables that week that could have played into it. Mm-hmm. Um, is I kind of reframed it as let's not look at it as a high load. Cause everybody thinks high volume, high intensity is always better, you know, and, and, the, and less amount is the worst. And you mean just in general? And just in general, you know, and like, you know, oh, well, I, I did 18 hours this week. Oh, I see what you mean. You know, like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, I did 18 hours this week, so yeah, I'm just doing awesome. And the person, I only did, I only did six hours. But this, then they, they look at the week and say, oh, my God, that's, uh, you know, 18 hours. How am I going to do that? Do they think of that as good or bad? You know what I mean? Like, Well, yeah, I mean, it's, they, that tr- it's true. And uh, so I think, and that's part of the reframe that I said with him was that I said, that's, that's not how you should look at any week. Regardless of the volume, the way you should look at it is this is the right volume. It could be 15 or it could be eight. So this is the the amount of volume that I'm getting is good. This is this is this is the excuse me. This is the right amount of volume. So the week before was 13 and a half hours. That was the right amount. The next week, the right amount was I think like seven uh, hours. And so instead of framing it as seven or less hours and less intensity as a quote unquote bad thing, which a lot of athletes have that are super consistent and type A and have that, that no, not addictive person, I, but like more is always better. I got to do more, 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 more. Um, and I can't take time off. Then, you know, they a lot of times suffer from overtraining and never really performing to their ability because they're, they never get totally fresh. And so reframing that with him in terms of respecting your body was, not looking at it as more is better and less is worse, but it's all about finding the right amount of yeah. volume. And that differs from everybody, no matter who it is. Uh, we all adapt differently and we all have different lives. So it's about respecting your body and, and your mind and knowing that it's the right amount and there is no really wrong volume as, you know, or intensity as long as it's the right one for you. Mm-hmm. Why do these uh, these people that are so bummed about l- low loads get so excited when taper comes around? <laughs> but they <laughs> and they don't do anything. Excited, <laughs> huh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know that you know. It, ha, well, let me ask you this: so in the the braces that you've had that have been, you've been you feel like you like I guess so Chattanooga is one of your best probably races to date. How did you compare your feelings and thought during that taper than maybe other ones in which your approach had been different and the results hadn't been as good? I took it more seriously. And okay. I, this this taper, because obviously we talk about this stuff constantly and it goes in and out of my ears sometimes. And But this particular one, I was just... It was almost like when I saw a taper on the schedule, my intensity mental, mentally went up because mm. I knew that in the past, what I had done with these tapers is, oh, I got to the taper, and I kind of like wanted to wing it a little bit, you know. And that means that could mean anything. That could mean um, eating like crap and sleeping in, and going, well, maybe I'll just blow this one over. I'll move this, you know, twenty-minute run to tomorrow or whatever. But I was really trying to be a little more scientific with this taper and and really stick to it because. As I said, it's sort of like I was in a fine-tuned race kind of mind, you know, state of mind. I wanted to not just do this race and go through the motions, but I wanted to see if I could really dial it in. So I felt like the last week and a half or whatever taper was pretty important. So I tried to really nail it and see what happened, you know. And I think that sometimes that does take an increased focus to, during taper just to... Because it's it's just little things that that are easy to kind of throw away, you know. 
Well, it sounds to me like you were confident that the amount you were doing was right. And then it wasn't too little and it wasn't too much. And I think a lot of that comes from a, a, a very sincere and deep belief and confidence in the load that I have was right before this. So this ro- – this, I, I did that well and I applied it well and you saw – the results you wanted to in training, you feel like your body adapted well, and now it's time to race. And even though I'm lessening the quote-unquote volume that you know everyone sees as like the the greatest indicator of who's doing more and who's going to be most prepared, you know, uh, example A, a four-hour run to go into an Ironman, you know, that means I'm more prepared for the run. Yeah. You know, we always look at volume, whereas you go into a taper, and the, a lot of the reason the athletes mostly freak out is also because they're just not confident in the why that they are doing it even in, in so when you dwindle things down to less volume you're really taking a microscope out and saying you know if for for a training volume you're, you're probably you're looking uh at the street at the end of your driveway at your house this is what i've built this is what i've done but if you don't feel super super confident about what's inside and all the details and once you step in the door you're going to be super anxious and you might not be – that's why a lot of athletes aren't confident in their taper, and they do more than they should because they weren't confident in what preceded it. And confidence and, and calmness and you know, kind of like, a, like that quiet confidence, I guess, is a good way to put it, during their taper, athletes that have that, it's a direct reflection of the work that they were confident they did beforehand. Mm. But athletes who really struggle in the taper, who always feel like they're not doing it or they're, lo- or they're losing fitness, it's more of a reflection of – their confidence in the work they did before and but more oftentimes it's it's more of a um a phrase they use that is really say okay what i'm hearing you actually say is you that's just an expression of the work that you feel like you didn't do before you tapered Mm -hmm. and that's why you see a lot of athletes who really struggle with the taper is that they didn't believe in the work that they did and they're more confident that the work that they didn't do and that's what they remember or they just weren't totally bought in, whether they're self-coached or working up a training plan or they're with the coach. They just weren't totally bought into what they were doing, so they, they train in, in a state of, of skepticism. And if you train in a state of skepticism, then you're never truly focused on committing what you're doing to that moment and executing it to the fullest. And if you can't do that, then you won't ever reach your fullest potential. Yeah. Well, I noticed that you know when you get two to three weeks within a race, people – a lot of confidence starts shooting out the window with people. And that, I mean, mainly because it's sort of like you just said, because people start looking at their training plans or kind of wonder. There's a lot of questions that start coming up in their minds, I think. And it's like, yeah, I got this race coming up in four months. I'm going to go crush this thing. And then this is, like time starts falling through the hourglass it gets a little closer and it's like man i don't know if this is the right thing should i be doing and then and then all of a sudden there's the other side of it too where people are uh As sands of the hourglass, sands of the hourglass. these glass. are the days of our taper <laughs> <laughs> there you go they uh they'll sometimes uh think they're doing too much in taper too i mean i think that uh, and that's also a reflection on like oh if you think two hour ride with a, li- a few efforts uh, ten days away from a half is too much you might want to you know think about what you've been doing listen man it's it all comes to being bought in it's all about being bought in from being bought in like truly day one I'm bought in so like let me give you an example like if you're you've been you and I both been at jobs where we liked it to an extent because it, it was it was exciting for a little bit, and even though there were things we probably knew we weren't going to like about it at the time, it fulfilled a need, and it was exciting, and you got a paycheck, and it was quote-unquote fun, and there were other things that, like I said, like disinterested us or we didn't like or that we wish we could change, but you're, you're willing to overlook them. But then as you become more and more disengaged or believing you're in the wrong job, those other things tend to be a little bit louder. And then all the good things tend to be drowned out by the noise that's created by all the things that you don't like or that you don't believe in. So you're you're present physically, but mentally and emotionally, you're somewhere else or you're already looking for another job. And athletes do that exact same thing when they aren't totally confident in what they are doing and why they are doing it. And 
why they're doing it. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, the why. Like if you know if it's the why you're doing, it, and they haven't seen, you know, the total the total complete benefit. And again, like I don't think it's I don't think it's common for for athletes to um, to feel that way. I think it's okay to feel that way. But it also takes a tremendous, and this is why I, I have to give so much credit to people who, um, you know, it's funny. Like they're, they're, I've talked to a few self-coached athletes before, and they say like, I'll just, I'll just never be coached um, because you know I, I feel like I'm kind of like selling, not not selling out, but it's like I feel like it's like cheating, or it's you know I'm you know if I'm scared that my race results won't reflect the fact that I'm getting coached. But what so many people don't understand is a you're just cheating yourself by probably not, but is that it takes an enormous amount of trust. It takes an enormous amount of trust and um, confidence and uh, almost in, on the on the outset kind of blind faith that this person who you're going to enlist to carry you on this journey has your best interest in heart. They always will. They will help you get there. And if you don't believe that person has your best interests in heart and that they're doing the best that they can to set you up for success, then you're going to be disinterested. You're going to go off the reservation in terms of training. You're going to – you're going to. If, and so once you disbelieve in the process and you become skeptical and you don't address that, you're no longer training with a purpose. You're training scared or you're training out of skepticism. And, and none of that has a purpose besides you're, you're training on the quote-unquote defensive I don't think this is working or it's not because I don't I don't feel like it's it's to my needs or I don't understand it so I'm going to do what I feel like is best for Robbie because I'm the only person that knows that no one else does and you know the truth is is that a lot of times we don't know what's best for us and that's why again that's why a lot of athletes get coaches is they feel like they they've gone down that route before and it hadn't worked out very well you know and so you got you got to kind of like what are the very First things that the a guy told me and and uh, when I got sober was listen man you know it, it was he was talking about religion and, and like higher powers and stuff and he's like I don't care if you believe in a god or a higher power Buddha or the river you need to believe in something else that there is a higher power out there that has your best interest in heart that knows the way your life is supposed to go more than you because up to this point you've been the CEO of your life and look at where it got you. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, yeah, you got a point there." Uh, you know, it's like uh, I get it, but you know, it's not always not obviously not that extreme as a coach, but so it does. It takes a huge amount of confidence and 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 faith, and then ultimately communication to to work with a, a coach and then be bought into a plan. But that's also why it takes a like if you're if you're working off like a training plan, you're self coaching, like you have to totally it's easy to believe something you throw out there because you just put it out there to believe. You know, like when you when you read articles and you know, from a magazine or things people post on Facebook, like every we all read the thing and the only thing that really sticks out sticks out to us really is the one that we already agree with. Yeah. You know, we we could skim through like that and we don't know, oh, oh, oh sharing this one because this one sentence in paragraph nineteen nails it. Yeah, and you, you send can, a you screenshot also, you can, with a highlighted just exactly, to that little like, Hello, nailed it, and then you're like, but wait a minute, the whole other part of the paper, like you know, it's totally it's taken away out of context. But that's how we see things. So yeah, it does. It it, it comes completely bought in, and it says I think a lot about you and your progression as a as an athlete and you know as a coach in that you know you've I think uh, you used to kind of like to quote unquote fly by the seat of your pants. And you and I talked about this at dinner the other night, you know, in terms of listening to your body and having that flexibility and being objective, but you've kind of had that flying by the seat of your pants thing because it was comfortable because you didn't you weren't challenging yourself in a different way to look in maybe into more depth to specific things to take in a different direction. And so that was comfortable for you. Mm-hmm. Even though it looked chaotic even though it might look chaotic for another person, it was comfortable for you. It was the most comfortable seat in the in the in the car, but the more you've you've gotten into coaching, the more athletes you've worked with, and when the more you've kind of dug in, it's like okay, well, I'm not ready to kind of be in the past. Now I'm kind of be right in the driver's seat and, and take a little more control and be confident where I'm going. And I'm just going to turn off my my life tendency GPS and I'm going to do this myself. Mm-hmm. But it's, but it does. It takes a huge leap of 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 just confidence in that. 
and, and I guess the, the biggest barrier for athletes, and I even go through this myself, uh, 100%, I go through it every year, is you have to set yourself up for success and then believe your, believe it's going to succeed. And then address it and look at it after the fact. You can't do it for four days and then quit. Yeah. Then think it's going to, oh, see, <laughs> didn't work. It's just not working for me, you know. Like, like it's got to happen. It got to see results in four days, or it's not going to happen. But you see, so you have to kind of just take every step possible to know that it's going to succeed. Because most oftentimes, what happens is the person who allows it to not succeed and become a failure is us, not what we're following. Not the diet didn't work for you. It's that you ate cake twice a week. Uh, it's not that it's not that the exercise program didn't work for you. Is that you skip five of your sessions? It's not that the the training plan didn't work for you in that specific race. It was because you didn't execute when you were supposed to. It, it, that that's the uncomfortable answer because guess whose fault it is? It's always ours. You know, like we the answer is us. Like we're 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 imperfect. You know, and that's that's something that I think we all understand. We just don't always act like it, and it's always everybody else is impact that's not working for us when we have to work for it and you have to buy in totally for weeks weeks if not months to see it work but again it takes confidence it takes patience and it takes um it takes it takes some humility too to be able to to do that yeah because we look at there's so many people would just look at and i've done this many times where i've just sort of looked at different parts of training plans and gone, ah, you know what, I'm just going to jump in here <laughs> or something because then what happens is you you feel like you're in a good spot and you jump in ahead of the game and then you miss them. So with me, it's been confidence, building confidence through consistency and and then being able to look at these training plans and, and what you're giving me and, and what I'm working from and actually do it because that's a and feel good about it. And that's why the whole respect your body thing is so important to me because I, when I got into this sport, and it's taken me so long to get to the point where I can understand when I'm pushing my... And I don't know if it's the 70, 80, 90% effort kind of stuff that I'm understanding better or what, but I am def- definitely not leaving myself out to be roasted on the coals you know, every other day or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, It's just sort of pushing my limits to the edge of where i'm at and then a little bit further and and that's just really been working for me man because i'm recovering and i'm getting better and it's and it's it's been enough where it's exciting but it hasn't been too much where it's draining or something like that so but i can i can answer that for you thank you because i I didn't know where i was going but i'd love to hear an answer well i mean it's because you believe you're going to continue to be consistent yeah. The old the old Mike Torale, you might go out and crush yourself because you know that once you get out there on the bike or the run, eh, you weren't really totally 100% positive you might be out there doing the same thing tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So if I'm anticipating taking more days off than not, then by all means, crush myself. But, yeah, when, you, but, when, you, but when you flip that switch of not just, I, I know I'm going to be consistent, but I really want to be. Then to go back to like the sleeping sleeping subject, it's God tomorrow. I'm really not looking forward to it. It's it's gonna kind of suck. I'm gonna stay up super late tonight because I got today. And then you wake up and you've got like no energy because you didn't get any sleep. Versus because you stay up three hours later than you probably should have. And the next day, yes, it's gonna suck because you made it suck because you didn't get enough sleep. And versus today was awesome and i really want to make tomorrow awesome so instead of staying up an extra two and a half hours watching some stupid netflix documentary i'm going to go to sleep because i want i want this today i want to try at least repeat it if not make it better tomorrow and you can't do that by wiping yourself clean every single day Mm -hmm. you have to be able to wake up you know and like we talk about all the time the sessions you do and the life you live and the days you built into your schedule, whether it's business, relationship, whatever, it has to be appropriately challenging. So you can grow from it, you can learn from it, and you get stimulated from it while also being, and you, you, you talk about this all the time, re-energized and almost refreshed to the point to where you can't wait to do it again. 
not the weekend warrior. I got to crush myself today because, frankly, I don't really know what tomorrow's going to bring. Because you don't have faith, you don't have confidence. Yeah, you don't know what you, know, you we don't know what last bring tomorrow. But for the most part, we know what to, we can, we know kind of what to expect. It's just that we don't believe our actions are going to meet the demands of what we want the next day to are going to require. Uh huh. And now you're to the point where, and this is a huge transcending like psychological shift with so many athletes that might have like reds and yellows for months upon months upon months upon months upon months, upon months and then all of a sudden they're just like boom the flip switched and they're just straight green like i mean as far as the eye can see and it's a, it's not a, it's not anything athletic it's not anything in their physical ability it's from the chin up it's believing that now they can make this happen by taking the steps that are going to do required to meet those demands and then when they do it they want to do it again the next day because they've shown themselves that they can and I think I think it's a natural progression in the kind of athlete life cycle for athletes is, is they see that. And in order to be super successful long term, you have to be bought into that process too. That that the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and the years turn into years. And when you look at your plan, you know you can't look at a race as an expiration date because then you rush it. You know, oh my, the mistake I've got has a you know expiration date. That's in four days. I've got to eat it now. Even if I don't want to, even if I don't feel like it, even though it might make me sick, I've got to eat it now. Versus, you know, if you looked at a steak, you know, really nice ribeye with good fat on it, and you're like, expiration date, 10 months. Which, A, a would be awesome. But B, um, you'd be like, I can, I can eat it when I'm ready. When I kind of want to. And just let things go instead of rushing things. And A... If you're going to invent a ribeye that's all that awesome that can withstand that kind of expiration date, email us. We'll sponsor you. Uh, but, <laughs> but B, that's just it, it's that it's not being in a it's not being in a rush and, and believing that you're you're on the right track and it's and and you I think especially like and you're going at the right speed. You know, it's neither too fast, it's too slow, it's just about right, and that's when you can just really 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 start to make huge gains and see huge self-confidence and be a guy who goes from a planned rest day to mentally like i really want to get out there and and then again but then it comes like once you go through that shift and that 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 mindset of now i want to now i want to now i want to you know you, you rarely ever find an athlete to where you're working the middle it's I don't want to work out at all. To I want to work out all the time. <laughs> it's it's very like very seldom you have that. Like, always want to work out the appropriate amount of the appropriate pace and speed. It's now for you. It's gone from oh, I'm taking a day off. Man, eh, no, I'm not taking a day off. I'm going. I'm going out and I'm doing this. And you got to be careful with it. And so it is. It's a it's a delicate it's a delicate balance um, of watching and allowing that pendulum to swing. You know, back and forth. Yeah, I I've, I thought of a question. It's it's really murky, but I in my race report for Chattanooga, I wrote about how I felt this was my Chattanooga seventy point three. How I felt it was my best race, but in the end, I put it wasn't my fastest seventy point three. And well, technically, it was my fastest, but Muncie the swim wasn't shortened, and my Muncie swim was like fifteen minutes longer. So, you know, however it worked out. But the point Mm was, um, my run wasn't as fast as Muncie, and neither was my bike. Was this your first 70.3? It was my, yeah. No, it was my second, but I think my first might have been close to fast. It was close. I think that was one I called within a minute. Yep. So, the weird part of this, though, is that that was my first two years in the sport. They were faster and everything like that. But I feel like I'm in better shape and I'm faster now. And then when I got done with that race, although it was slower than the Muncie PR that I had, I I felt like 10 times better. So, in my mind, I'm kind of like, did I leave it? Did I leave it out there or did I kind of hold back? But... I can't. I don't feel like I left it out there. So, do you know where I'm going with this? Like, there's a weird little line here where I've run faster, but it has absolutely destroyed me. And I think it's probably because I wasn't trained up, right? Is that where I'm going? 
I think I think it's the one of the most difficult things for athletes to do in separating their performance and filtering out filtering it out outside of a result at a specific race because mm. he, because it's just it, you, they're so not that's what you talk about all the time yeah like you just you can't you just can't equate them like they're just it's almost it's almost impossible even unless you know for a fact it like the conditions are the exact same the same person who put out the buoys in the race exactly put them in the exact place every every single time and the conditions are the exact same and you have to wear a wetsuit every single time and you swim perfectly straight and transition your spot it's in the exact same place and you don't have any mess ups and you get out you run the exact bike course and you um don't have any issues and the weather is exactly perfect same temperature same humidity same dew point same wind speed then you get off the bike and it's the exact same run course same temperature same humidity same dew point you run the street you run the lines you're supposed to run you pace yourself on the bike perfectly uh the percentage is the exact same and then you finish yeah, that race happened once, and it will never happen again. It's not because you won't do the race again. It's because that specific race, you will never you, – you, everyone does the same event multiple times. No one does the same race every single time. Especially and that everybody is, doing Ironman Louisville this year. And that, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like the like one of the biggest like crocs of baloney that people like to compare themselves to that that race to race they're they're none of them are the same none of them are the same and you might do the same event but no one does the same race because the conditions are to- let me give you an example boulder ironman for sunday Currently, the high temp is called for like sunny and 61, okay, which is like best case scenario ever for a race. <laughs> Last year, I think it was like 94. So let me ask you this. You're going to go to the same event, okay, or you want to call it the same race. And let's say you're a, you were in great fitness last year and you ended up doing like a 10 forward and you executed your day just perfectly, in whole, in in just in just really 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 tough conditions, okay. Ninety four in Boulder with altitude is brutal. We had athletes there last year, and they said it was like one of the hardest events they've ever done. So let's say let's say you squeaked out a ten forty. Let's say your training has been like meh. It's been okay. You know, it's been all right. And you don't execute very good race, and the conditions are perfect, and you come in at like a ten thirty seven. Tell me about that. Uh-huh. Is it going to be PR? Yeah, you you crush that event, but I would I would argue that your best race at that event was the year before. And so when you when you go to comparing like Muncie and Chattanooga and the eight, you know where you are in age, I think one of the biggest things that you can look at, especially with as athletes kind of tip that that forty four to forty five scale, when a lot of athletes start to see maybe not a huge decline, but it takes a lot more effort to to hang tough. You know, you got you got to look at you know where you were, uh, you know, against the field and how you did. You know, even it's almost so identical, t- actually. Do what now? It was almost identical against the field. Right. So, I mean, you're taking you know fitness, but I think also the uh, a, a great fitness measurement as well as, and this is something that I really that I feel like I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing a good job of. Um, with athletes is when they have a good race and they PR, they feel like they executed pretty well. And then three days after the race, they're like, yeah, I, I feel pretty good. You know, I feel, I feel like I did well. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm so, talking so, about. So some man. people would be like, Oh, I just didn't try hard enough. Oh, I'm like, you're yeah, right. Yeah. I looked at you at one point. I'm like, Hey man, Mike, <laughs> you're not trying enough, man. Let's get going. <laughs> no one feels that way. You know? And I think that's also like a misunderstanding when people race in, like I say, people race at like altitude of the race in like this extreme heat, you know, and, and they might leave the, and you have to you have to play your cards right as a more strategic race than like more of a blunt forced trauma race where it's just about how hard I run because mm-hmm. I can just let it rip because it's I'm, my, my limiter isn't my aerobic system or my anaerobic system and my lungs, my heart. It's my it's the heat, you know, but if you if you go a race where it's like 60 and like perfect, then you should be able to just absolutely 
bury yourself. But if you weren't heat acclimated at all and you went to try to quote unquote bury yourself when it's 85 and humid or whatever, then you're going to end up walking. And so it becomes a it now then becomes also a, a strategic race where you can't really bury yourself physically from from every single area. It's more about you know kind of like triaging the situation, the event, and the day, and then you finish. And that's a lot of times why some people feel pretty good. You know, because they weren't they weren't able to just bury themselves. They were pl- they were playing it a little bit not safe. I'm not I'm not saying safe, but they had to play their cards right mm-hmm. given the day and the circumstance. So that's another reason why you might feel different. It's not a, it's not a, a direct correlation on how hard you worked. It's that you again, it's a different race. Same event, every race is different. Yeah, but that Monty race, we we're back in our drinking days, man. It's that same thing. You, I think you were talking about. <laughs> what's first that? Was, your first one, I was. That's absolutely right. That's right. Yeah, oh, the, yeah. The first that still one beats me away, man. Um, but so I was still in that. I'm, I'm talking about me. I, I guess me more than anything. It's like it's that thing you talk about where you're still trying to hit your first PR, <laughs> and how you can that pain tolerance level mm-hmm. thing. That's the difference. I mean, and that is the the ultimate lack of respect for the body. Because I actually, during those years, I was just, I do feel like I was just pushing myself like to the crazy levels, but I wasn't in shape for it. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. I was always over mm-hmm. shooting my shape. That's such a great point. Like it is such a great point. I was uh, faster, people, but <laughs> you know, it's uh, like. But were you? Well. You know, it's a good argument, but yeah, on those one days, it was sort of like, uh, I can do this for one day. Oh, I got it. I can do it for one day. I kept, you know, doing that instead of like, okay, <laughs> let's be more rational here. Yeah, you're somebody, uh, you're somebody I might contract out for a race, but you're never somebody I would hire. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, because I'm looking at long term success continual down the road. I'm not looking at a one off. Yeah. Yeah, but in, my point is it started really catching up with me, man. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it was just in my race, and I don't know. I quit. I'm out of this sport. I'm in this sport. Yeah, I love this sport. Oh, it's a good race. <laughs> yeah, yeah but I'm then quitting. it's like, bike, where'd Mike bike, go? Mike goes on eBay for 24 hours. You don't need to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, where'd Mike go? Oh, he's, I don't know. You haven't seen him in three weeks since that race. <laughs> yeah. It's just like licking my wounds. But that's a bad spot to be in. I think a lot of people do that, actually. A lot of people, yeah, because that's the, it's, it's, uh, you know, I think it's why, you know, and people rib me on that, rib me on this, um, it's probably fair, but I know that's fine. Um, why I like, why I never, why I personally, and I kind of, it doesn't, yeah, it does kind of bother me when I, when everyone wears like all these, like if they're at an Olympic distance race, they wear their Ironman shirt to like check in at their, um, (laughs) <laughs> during during check in and then like race morning like hey I'm racing today but just in case things just in case things don't go well <laughs> <laughs> just in case yeah right here Psst. hey I'm at Chattanooga did it we didn't swim but shh, don't tell anybody so I still got the shirt and and we I think we talked about this in terms of like when somebody posted about the most difficult Ironman on stuff I was like the one of the smartest guys I've ever known in triathlon first thing he, when he, he told me was the hardest race you're ever going to do is the one you're training for now and the one that you're about to do uh-huh. and the one you're trying to prepare to because nothing is ever the same. We want to talk about races being different and there's only events. And what makes races even more different is where, where you are and what you're doing in life. You know, go back to like, like no obligations. Cause it's, it's still to, to this day, it still bothers me and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna quit until my PRs and my full distance and my 70 point there is three distance are, um, are PRs from when I was sober, not from when I wasn't. Cause that still just eats at me, <laughs> uh, you know, I've now, but I've had my best overall results since I got sober from when I get against the field. I've had my first ever podium in a 70.3 event. I've won some races. And so, that that's still there Mm -hmm. but my life you know from a guy who could even when i was just like nothing was i mean my life was an absolute train wreck and that's like giving myself a compliment um 
I had like no obligations, even if I did, I wasn't fulfilling them. But and now I'm, you know, married, you know, have athletes to coach, have a son. Have, I mean, it's like, so you again, like you can't, you just can't compare them. But that's what makes every race you're training for now the hardest one you've ever done. And uh, wearing a shirt to like your event isn't disrespecting that, but I think it's living in the past about a lot of things and i know it's a it's it's, it's good and you, sh- you should be happy about it i'm not saying that you should be totally pumped and proud of your accomplishments but i'm saying like if you really truly want to get in that mindset of of today of it's about what i do when i've just done today that's going to be the expression of really truly where i am instead of you know rocking my 1999 you know kona shirt when you know it's 20 years down the road uh team like yeah congrats but where are we where are we now you know, and because that's that's how we judge ourselves, um, and I think that's you know again, you don't want to be rocking your letter jacket uh, at your twentieth high school year reunion. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but I think it's about being present. And again, I think it's I think it's a great lesson in that the the fitness level you have and the results you're putting down aren't just you know don't just look at them through the lens of the immediate result and the event and the race and the time and the place you have to have a much greater and a more appreciative perspective of who you are and where you are in your life and as long as you're fulfilling those needs and you're being a good husband you're being a good father you're around for your kids and your training is has load is lightened a little bit and you're doing you know all the things that are important in life that aren't just hobbies you know being a parent isn't a hobby being a a significant other isn't a hobby. You know, being a parent isn't a hobby. You know, a job for most people it shouldn't be a hobby. Those things are important. They're things that are that are truly at the fabric of who we are as a person and that allow us to live the life that we live. So if you're addressing those things appropriately and you feel good about it and you can put your head uh, on your pillow at night and sleep and then your results, let's say they're just even like slightly off or just as good then you should be incredibly happy that you've been able to manage those things both successfully. Because what oftentimes happens is people tend to grade themselves on a scale, not of performance, but of sacrifice. I have sacrificed so much, and maybe I've been a just absolutely shitty spouse and a terrible parent, and I've missed way too much, and my job has suffered. And so when I go into a race, if I can't validate that, for, be it for just a moment, then I'm going to feel even worse. And so they grade it on a much higher scale because the sacrifice and the things that they've given up or the things that they've not uh, – or the obligations that they've had, they've just totally you know, put out of their memory or just not attended to, then you're going to feel a ton of guilt and a ton of, of shame. Even if you want to talk about it, there's a lot of shame to be had there. If you can't perform. And so when athletes go into races like that, they carry that load and that tension with a vengeance. I know this from personal experience because before because before I got sober, my last I don't know, the last six months before, I mean you know this, you're around, I DNF'd three straight races. And I was even in one of them I wasn't I was winning. And I just dropped out. Because A, I was in just a really, you know, kind of not kind of on a horrible place, but the amount of pressure that I had put on myself to justify the suffering and the things that I wasn't doing was so great that I knew no matter what, it wouldn't meet that status quo. And athletes who aren't even in that kind of predicament, who go into Ironman for their first time or go into these big races and have these huge expectations – I've rarely met a person or an athlete that have gone into these races or these events or whatever you want to call it and have done things the right way and felt good about themselves and their training and how they've dealt with other areas of their life. I have never met one that has been like, you know what? I'm just really scared today is not going to go very well because they've had their priorities in order. And again, you know, it just it goes back to understanding and realizing where you are in your season of life and what's like and remembering the differences in that we shouldn't judge ourselves based on the execution of a specific digital time 
you know, um, and chasing somebody whose life is totally different. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not fair to ourselves, but yet we do it because it's just become a pattern. The, I want to go back to that, what you just said about that race that you were leading and you DNF'd. I want to, what were the emotions like at that? Do you remember like right before you decided to make that decision? Because oh, I, I think that I, I feel that a lot in training. The sim- yeah, I remember, I remember exactly where I was. It was about 30, it was 30 months after, it was 30 months. It was 30 days, I think, before I ended up going to treatment. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> uh, I let out of the swim by a long shot. I was leading on the bike, and I remember thinking, this hurts, and it's still not going to hurt enough. And this still isn't going to be enough, so who cares? As in two things. For me at that point, it was about pain because I was already in a lot of pain. And, and the pain I was producing in triathlon was was what I was trying to do to help mask. Like if I didn't have triathlon, I probably would have drank myself to death. Mm-hmm. I, I totally believe that. But because that's how much pain I was in at the time. But triathlon and, and training was giving me an opportunity. I wouldn't say it was a healthy uh, but it was the healthiest thing I had going on in my life was it gave me an opportunity to control pain and give myself pain and allow myself to feel that pain that was, you know, a good pain. It wasn't a bad pain or a scary pain. It was good pain. Was so it yin it, and yang kind of thing? Yeah. It, 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 it like would kind of sign a scale of pain. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it, I think it is, you know, like in, um, you know, and I, I want to talk about a little bit more than that in depth in just a second, but it's, so I, I felt that and I was like, it, is, it still isn't going to do the trick. You know, and so it's like a very, it's very symbiotic of one, one vodka tonic isn't going to do it, but six will, you know, but you can do that. But at that point it was like, I, even if I just smash myself the race, I know it's not going to go away. It was like, I, I was, I think the first time I finally understood that I can't do this anymore with triathlon. I can't do this anymore racing. I can't bury myself any further because I just, just not within my limits. You know, it's not that it's to match that pain. I don't have it within me physically. To, to to match the mental and emotional pain that I was feeling. And so I thought that and then I thought that even if I even if I won, I knew it still wasn't gonna mean anything. You know, it, it wasn't gonna replace anything. It wasn't gonna, you know, fulfill anything in my life. It was like that that moment of like extreme pain and like total emptiness to where like there wasn't like even any excitement around it. Even mm-hmm. like I, you know, I was like I was like yeah you know what you can't, you could no longer fool yourself anymore, um, and and so again I think it's uh, I think athletes struggle with that. I think athletes who and this has just been kind of recently you alluded to this I think a couple of minutes ago about like as I've talked about this before in a podcast about how deep how deep I could dig back then. I mean, I could just absolutely bury myself when I needed to, and I don't do that much anymore. But I just kind of had a, kind of more like a breakthrough recently. I think I think a lot of athletes that I know, because I work with a lot of them that have that have had some kind of trauma in their life that have gone through, whether it's PTSD or a traumatic event or um, something that we oftentimes have this like negative thought process and response to pain and. When I got sober, all that changed. My mentality changed. My whole life changed. My mind, everything. Uh, um, and I've always kind of had a, a dis, a, a weird relationship since then with pain. And something I've just kind of recently formulated when I do intervals and stuff now is I actually talk to myself like before I do it. Um, you know, and, and I kind of have a conversation of like, this pain is okay. You know, this pain is good. And this isn't this pain isn't going to hurt me, you know. So so it's a relationship, you know. And you, I think you have to. And in the, the I kind of like to do like a mantra, even though that might sound stupid. But um, another thing I say, which I think is is probably the, one of the most under talked about things with athletes, is one of the phrases I say to myself is, "And your pain is good enough." Because I think so many athletes have this mentality of, "I don't work hard enough." I see somebody else. And they seem like they're just working harder. Like our pain isn't good enough. And so that association with extreme pain means better or a different product is so misguided and is such a falsehood by what's projected in the society that we live in today. You know, no pain, no gain. You know, you got to grind it out. You got to suffer, suffer fest. 
like pain is the most relative thing in the world. You have no idea what someone's pain scale is and what that means to them. You know, a a specific interval at the same exact percentage of threshold for one person because the way they're wired and the things they've been through could be like a seven. And for another person, it could be like a four. But yet we judge that. And so I think understanding and telling yourself that, that you know, this pain is okay, this pain is good, and my pain is enough. So whatever I'm able to give forth today, because there are some days where – I'm, I expect myself to be able to reach a specific level of, of you know, maybe quote unquote pain to hit a, a interval on the bike, maybe. But if I understand, if I tell myself that, and my pain on one day equals a 270 watt interval for eight minutes, but then the next week, my pain, you know, in my relationship with it, equates to a 250 watt. To me, it's still good. I still did a good job. Not a, I, I, not a relationship of I just don't have it today. That was bad. And I think there's just that there's so many healthy, there's so many more options for healthier conversations for us to have internally with ourselves and our dynamic and, and not being so hard on ourselves and, and self-deprecating and just that self-hate that you can set yourself up for so much more success in determining on the outset that – that not only is my workout of my interval going to be a success, but my effort determines its success. Not it's not my, not what the data spits out and what training spits, not what training peaks spits out at the end. It's my effort and the amount of giving because what I'm giving is enough, and that's all that should be required of anyone all the time. I like that, dude. And let's probably end it there. Sure. It's important we to understand that. People. Deep, deep. So, yeah, tune into that and really understand it. That's all I could say about it. You know, it's like, listen, pay attention, and exactly what you were just talking about. You know, tune into it all the time and don't be lazy. I think that's one of the things, right? You get on, you start working out and we're like, yeah, we're doing all this. And you just sort of lose track of where you're going. But uh, And it's easy to kind of dig holes or not go hard enough or whatever. But I think if you're paying attention, you understand your threshold and that's good enough. Totally agree. Crushingiron.com. If you want more about this, uh, operation, um, join our closed Facebook group, uh, search crushing iron group. And we'll let you in there. You can reach me crushing iron at gmail.com. Robbie's at, c26coach at gmail.com that's me that's him that's me uh anything else we got i think that might be about it that is it we had our last uh slot taken for august camp so we are sold out again all of our tri camps it's three for this year um are all sold out uh august has a well i'll put up a wait list today for august camp but june is you, there's no shot that one's been sold out for a while um that's sold out two years in a row and that's something i'm super proud of um and it's one of the more fun things i think you and i are able to do with this um is meet so many awesome people and have such a good time and train in awesome locations but we will be uh releasing the 2020 dates because i always think that we we might put things out there too early but apparently we don't put them out there enough uh, or early enough so people can register and make their plans and how, see how they develop around races um, and you know, ask off you know, for PTO and vacations and all this kind of thing. So we will have our um, 2020 camps open. They will open the general public on July 1st, um, and we'll announce those. We're going to do a little bit something different um, than we've had the uh, kind of in terms of layout and format for camps. Uh, not, not totally different, but a uh, different focus for each camp. And then we've also got a our first uh, 2020 swim camp is online, and that will be in Chattanooga with some fun things. That is online. Maybe we'll throw a couple of links to those in the show notes, or at least the swim camp. The other one's not online yet, but um, but that's it. If you uh, haven't checked us out or want to check us out further, you can always go to our one-stop shop that is crushingiron.com. And it's got really all the info you need 
to uh, need to know about what we do and what we've been doing on the tabs at the top from coaching, uh, prices, training plans and packages, our club membership, gear, uh, camp videos, podcasts. I mean, you name it, it is there. It's everything we do. Uh, check it out. And uh, again, always let us know what you think. Subscribe. Give us a rating. And we'll see you on uh, on Monday. Yep. Oh, and uh, we've got some limited hats, visors, and long sleeve t-shirts. So if you if you're interested, email me crushingiron at gmail dot com. Ding ding. All right, man. I will see you, catch you later. Bye bye.